In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. For the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, walk with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. No fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry till final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. In Christ alone.
Did you like that offertory? <clears throat> if that didn't crank your tractor, your battery's dead, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we come in the lovely name of Jesus today, thanking you for all that you are to us and all that you do for us, all of your blessings. And Father, we thank you for your healing power that's been among us this week. Father, we ask you to Continue to heal those that need your healing. We ask you, Father, to touch the hearts of those that are lost, that they might accept you as their Savior. Father, we ask you to go with us now into the other parts of the service. We ask you to give Brother Jimmy your words for us in this hour. Keep us safe. Amen. 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 I enjoyed that too. How many of you knew most of those songs as they were going along? took me a minute, but I was like, when I'd hear it, you know, you'd start tapping your toe. Saw Pepper over there. She was kind of singing a little bit, too, you know. And Jim had his, we were all tapping our toes a little bit. You just can't help it, you know. It's just, just something that just fills you, and you just want to, you know. And that's the way it should be, amen? amen? That's the way it should be. Well, this morning, as, uh, as I was noticing that Brother Mylon wasn't here, I began to get concerned, and I thought, well, he's usually... Here before me, I got here a little bit early today, and then when he when he showed up, he parked really close to the building. I thought he never does that. Something weird is happening today. He pulled me out of Sunday's preach. I gotta go. I'm like, okay, all right, we got it. But let's pray for him. I know they've had that going around in, uh, in their family, and we're glad that he didn't give it to us today. Anyway, how many of you believe that God has a sense of humor? If you don't believe that, look at your neighbor. Okay? <laughs> Just <laughs> My wife probably says that every morning when she wakes up and looks at me. Uh, or Samuel probably looks at me and says, oh my goodness, daddy, what in the world? Uh, but God does have a sense of humor and God has a way. Even in our scripture, a lot of times Jesus has a way of telling stories not that he's making fun of folks, but he just wants them to think a little bit. He wants them to think. Sometimes, if you've ever been in a courtroom or watched a courtroom scene on television, prosecutors never ask questions that they don't already know the answer to, do they? And that's, that's kind of how our Lord was. Whenever He would ask questions, He knew the answers. He just wanted to see what they would say. Uh, this morning we're going to look at a story that many of us know uh, from Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, uh, starting with verse 25. Most of you know this as a story of the Good Samaritan. We're going to look at it as it begins with a certain lawyer asking Jesus some questions. If you're familiar with this entire chapter, you know that in the beginning, Jesus sent out 70 people. And he sent them out two by two. And he told them to go out to, the, to every home and to preach the gospel. And whoever would receive you, that you were to stay there and you were to, to, to uh, break bread with them and enjoy time with them and preach the gospel... But whoever rejected you, they were to shake the dust off your feet and keep on moving. Not to waste time with folks that were not going to listen. So this morning, please listen. <laughs> Follow along with me as I read, starting with verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your, all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you shall live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Let's pray. 
Dear Lord, we thank you so much for these words that speak to our heart. Help us to hear your words this morning and understand that there are so many people that have needs, not necessarily something big, but sometimes just even something small, that if we just maybe take five minutes, we could speak to them, you could speak through us to them, Lord, and might brighten their day. We thank you and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, how many of you know any lawyers? Any lawyers? Okay. Uh, I'm reminded of a story uh, about the Jesus and the devil. I don't know if you've heard this story before where uh, Jesus, they were, uh, there was a certain, uh, uh, I guess he was an engineer. I guess we'll use that for, for purposes here. And he was supposed to go to heaven, but somehow the devil stole him. And he, and he, and he ended up going to hell, and, and Jesus came to get him. And he said, hey, devil, he's mine. I'll just be taking him now. He said, oh, no, you can't have him. I'm going to keep him. Uh, no, no, you have to give him to me. Now, he's coming with me. The devil said, no, nope, not going to do it. Now, look, I'm taking him. Jesus says, I'm taking him with me right now. He says, now, look, if I have to, I will sue you to get him back. He says, where are you going to get a lawyer? They're all down here with me. So. If you know any lawyer friends, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that probably. You know, when I was talking in youth group this morning, I was asking them, like, what joke should I tell this morning? And they were, they were giving me, like, maybe this one, that one, not that one. So I didn't mention that this morning, though, anyway. But this young man, he's coming to test Jesus. I mean, the audacity that he's coming to test Jesus, to ask him, not so much that he really believed like Jesus was going to tell him what he actually had to do to receive eternal life. He was just trying to see what Jesus would say. But Jesus turned the tables on him just to see what he would say. He's a lawyer. He says, what does the law tell you to do? You, you know so much about the law. What does it say? And so he told him. He said that you should love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself which we find from, uh, in Leviticus 19, 18, and also Deuteronomy 6, 5. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Go ahead and do this, and you'll live. But the young man just couldn't leave it at that. He, he thought, no, 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 no. We're going we're to carry this a little further. That is just too easy. We're going to carry this a little bit further because I, I want to hear some more about this. He said, okay. You know, you know what they say? You know, if you mess with the bull, you will get the horns. And the young man was about to get it. So, he says, wishing to justify himself to Jesus, says, who is my neighbor? And then, in verse 30, Jesus began to tell him. He says, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, and they stripped him, beat him, and, and went off, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a certain priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise, a Levite also, he went and came to the place and saw him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan who was on journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him, and he bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Now, which of these three do you think provided, pr proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Now, I'm sure that's not what the young man was expecting Jesus to say. He was probably expecting some more guidelines. Now, if you'll just do this, you'll do this, you'll do this. And I think sometimes as Christians... We kind of make it sound like it's a religion of a bunch of do's and don'ts. You know, you got to do this, you can't do that. And, and if you'll just do this and don't do those things, then you're going to be okay. Jesus was trying to say, listen, let, let me explain to you what this really is about. Let me explain to you what our Heavenly Father really expects of us. Let's look at the story real quick. He, 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 he mentions a certain priest. He, the priest comes by and he sees this guy laying there, half dead. And he passes by. Why do you think he just passed by? I mean, a priest, man of God, seemed like he would want to help, wouldn't he? If nothing else, he'd want to pray over him or something. But no, he just passes by on the other side. It's almost like he's walking upon the man, he sees him, and he deliberately goes out of his way 
to go on the other side of the road. And the man may have been conscious. He may have been reaching out saying, anything, help me, just something. And yet he passes by and does nothing. That doesn't, that doesn't seem like very much compassion to me. Now, why would someone do this? Let's put it in terms of like something that might happen to us today. I can imagine if I'm, I'm driving down the road and I'm coming, going down the parkway and I see someone on the side of the road and I know I've got to be at church, got to teach Sunday school, and I look over there and see someone, am I going to stop? Be late for church? Maybe not even show up for church? What am I going to do? We have to have discernment. We have to decide, what am I going to do? We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school. And we said one of the reasons why we're afraid sometimes, we're afraid someone might be trying to take advantage of us. If I stop and help them, there might be three guys waiting to jump me. If I stop to help them, it's going to take time away from me that I had planned to do something else. If I stop and help him, I'm going to have to get involved. I'm going to have to come out of my pocket. I may have to spend some time that I really didn't want to spend. (coughs) So the priest walks by. He says, I'm not going to do that. And besides that, the priest, were to touch him, get any blood, he could not go into synagogue. He would be unclean. And then he would not be able to perform his duties, which he thought were more important than helping this person. Sometimes we we get so busy trying to do what we think is the things we ought to do that we miss the things that are most important. Priests definitely miss that one. So now a Levite comes by. Levite was a scribe, those that uh, wrote down uh, scriptures, laws. He came to the same place, saw him pass by on the other side. Now I wonder if he saw the priest ahead and thought, wow, what's going to happen here? Watch the scene. I wonder what he's going to do. He's passing by. I'm going to do what he did. I ain't going to get involved. Now this is a Jewish, the Jewish man that fell here. It's a, it's a fellow Jew. You would think they'd want to help. Nothing else. Levite says no. Now, we don't know that, that he saw what the priest did. We don't know that he looked out, saw another Christian. Like sometimes when we watch other Christians, we see what they do. When you're a, a young Christian and you're not sure about certain things and how we should, should um, proceed, we kind of watch those that have gone before us. We kind of watch what other Christians do and then we, we, we're influenced by what they do. We need to remember that. People are always watching. Our youth, our kids, they're watching what we do. And if we make bad decisions, we make a decision based on selfishness, based on I don't have time, based on I don't want to come out of pocket, guess what they learn? Why I I saw Brother Jimmy do that, so it must be okay. Brother Jimmy said that the other day, so it's got to be right. We have to be very careful. Now, I don't know if that's what happened with the Levite, but he could have seen. Or he could have just decided on his own, listen, the guy is laying there, probably going to die anyway. What am I going to do? I can't help him. I'm not a doctor. So he passes by on the other side. Then a Samaritan man comes by on his journey. Now, you have to understand that Samaritans and Jews did not get along at all. Samaritans were a race of people that were half-breeds. When the Assyrian nation came in and took in, took the Hebrew people captive for like 70 years, they killed a lot of them, took a lot of them into slavery, and they interbred with them so that a lot of these, these Samaritans were half-breeds, part Hebrew, part Assyrian. The Jews hated the Assyrians and therefore didn't want to have anything to do with anything that could even be uh, remotely remind them of the Assyrians. So the Samaritans were no good. In fact... The story that, we, 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 that I mentioned uh, in Luke chapter 10, when Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet and keep going, that was a reference to what people would do if they had to walk through Samaria. They hated it so much, they, don't eat, they didn't even want the Samaritan dust on their feet. It would somehow contaminate them, and they didn't want any part of it. And that's where that expression came from. But this Samaritan man sees this, this Jewish man... And he, you would think he would go, no way. Now, how would he know? I don't know how you could tell if he was Jewish or not, but he knew. And he had compassion. He, did, he was on a journey. He, was, he had purpose. He wasn't just walking down the street with nothing to do. He was actually on journey. He had plans. 
How many of us would, would stop on our vacation? We're, we got everybody in the car. We're getting ready to go. And all of a sudden, we see someone over there on the side of the road. And we know if we don't get to a certain town by a certain time, I can tell you, if you're ever going north to going through Nashville, you've got to get through Nashville a certain time of day. You can't just go through there uh, uh, at lunch and, and, and at, at, uh, when the rush hour starts or you'll be there forever. And we, we try to plan our trips that way, don't we? I mean, I do. I try to plan so I'm not stuck in traffic. I'm impatient. Don't like to sit in traffic. I lived in Atlanta for my whole life. You know, I, I, you think I'd be used to it, but I hate traffic. Love it here. So he's on journey. He's got purpose. He's planned to go somewhere. He's got plans. He's got things he wants to do. But he sees this man and has compassion. And he decides to stop. Now, he could have just stopped and said, hey, you all right, buddy? Say a prayer. See you. But he didn't. He picked him up, got his blood on him, got dirt and whatever else was on him, put him on his donkey or, or whatever, camel or whatever he had there, says beast, and he takes him to an inn. Now, he's given up his time, and now he's coming out of pocket. When it says he gave two denarii, a denarii was equivalent to one day's wage. So he's given up two days of work that he probably would have spent on his vacation. Now, I don't know about you. If you're like me and you plan on your vacations, you know what stuff costs. You know, if you go, anybody ever been to Disney? You know that if you plan well, you can get the most out of Disney and not spend that much money. Or you could, you'll spend some, but you know what I mean. Well, he's got to come out of pocket money that he would have spent on his journey Things he could enjoy for himself, he's going to give it to, in, to, in, to take care of this man. I just don't know if a lot of folks would be willing to do that. I mean, we might drive up and say, hey, this guy, I saw this guy. You know, we might call 911 and, and say, hey, you know, come help him. But I'm literally going to take him to the end and, and give money and say, listen, take care of him. Now, he, he bandaged him up as best he could. He got him there. He left the money for the innkeeper, and he says, listen, I'll come back, and tomorrow, anything else that's owed, I will give you that. I mean, my goodness, this guy seems too good to be true. But Jesus is trying to make a point here. At the end of the story, he asked the, the, the lawyer, now, which of these three men was a neighbor to the man who, who had fallen among thieves? And he says, well, the one that showed mercy upon him, go and do the same. Now, this is an extreme case here. We're talking about life and death here. I would venture to say that most of us don't walk up on folks like this or in this condition. Now, you may have. If you have, then God bless you. I hope you helped. I hope you were able to help. Most, but most of us, some, we don't walk. It's not necessarily an extreme case. It might just mean you've got to give up five minutes of your time. Just to help somebody. Just to help somebody. Give a, put a smile on somebody's face. Just to let somebody know that, hey, somebody does care about you. The Lord cares about you. You know, when I, were, I used to work in Atlanta, I used to have what I call, it, it was my designated homeless guy. Now, that sounds kind of strange. How do you have a designated homeless guy? Was he assigned to you? No, I used to work at the courthouse, and every day there'd be all these people, you know, people coming up asking for money. I couldn't give money to all of them, so I chose one guy. And I told him, I said, okay, here's what we'll do, man. When I see you, if you're here, and I have money, I will give it to you. You know, I'll give you not everything, but I'll give you something. He said, okay, that's cool. So we kind of had that arrangement. But I said, every time I'd see him, I'd want to give him a word from the Lord. And he would appreciate that. And he would say, God bless you, man. There was another time I, was, I went to McDonald's for lunch. I don't go to McDonald's for lunch hardly anymore. My wife won't let me. But I, I went to McDonald's for lunch. And this is back when they had the supersize, the big old 42-ounce drink, and the giant supersized fries, which is just ridiculous. So, but I got a, you know, the uh, double quarter pounder with cheese with no pickles or onions because I don't like them. The supersized fries... The big, I mean, the giant thing here. The big 42-ounce drink, which is ridiculous, and an apple pie. Because they'd give you that for free back then if you, if you got the, the combo or the extra value meal. They don't like it when you say combo. But 
But I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting in a parking lot somewhere. Uh, if you're familiar with Atlanta all, at all, it's where um, it's over there on City Marcus, where um, there used to be a Kmart there, but it's gone now. But all of a sudden, there's somebody walking up on me, and I can see him out of the corner of my eye. And this dude's walking; he's coming, he's coming right for me. And I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do? I don't know this guy. I don't know what he's doing. As I glance, I'm like, this dude, he's got like a suit on, but he's wearing a do rag, you know. And so I'm thinking, something's going on here. It's not, it's not normal. And so as he gets closer, I'm thinking, okay, we talked about this this morning. It's the fight or flight syndrome, okay? I'm either going to get out and I'm going to fight this guy, or I'm fixing to crank up the car and I'm driving away. Or there's a third choice. I could talk to him. So I said, well, let's talk to him. Let's see. Let's just give him a chance. So I roll down the window, and I, I'm like, uh, I, and I was kind of mean because I was kind of nervous a little bit. So I'm like, sir, what, what, what can I do to help you? What, what do you want? He's like, sir, please don't shoot me. Don't kill me. I, I, I just need some help. And I'm thinking, he's afraid of me? I mean, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. He's got this suit, durag. I'm thinking he's getting ready to do something to me, and now he's afraid of me. I'm thinking, that's, that's kind of strange. Maybe I look weird. Maybe he thought I was a... One of these skinhead dudes or something. I don't know. But anyway, so he asked me, he says, listen, I need some help getting down the line. You know, I, I don't have any, or maybe you could help me. You could buy my lunch or something. I'm sitting there, I'm going, lunch, huh? Look at my bag. Look at him. Look at my bag. It's a big bag, too. Look at him. I'm thinking, oh, man. I said, okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my double quarter pounded with cheese, with no pickles or onions, and my large fry, and my 42-ounce drink, and my apple pie. But I want to know, what, you know, what are you going to do after this? What's go, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm not sure. I said, listen, man, you need to find a local church. You need to find a local church, find the Holy Spirit, the love of God, because those are the people that will be there for you when you're in need. He said, he said you know what, you're so right. And I said, okay. So I gave it to him, and I thought, well, now I've got to go back to the drive-thru. Uh, and only had like 30 minutes left for lunch. Well, as I'm going back to the drive-thru at McDonald's, I look back in the rearview mirror. I'm the only car in this parking lot. I don't see him. Where'd he go? I thought he's going to go sit down. He's going to eat the food or something. Gone. Vanished. Poof. Out of thin air. Some, I don't know. The Bible says that many have entertained angels unaware. I do not know. But I know that... I had a choice to make when I met this guy. I could either run away, say, no, I don't have time, or I could try to help him. And I'm not bragging on myself because maybe I was more afraid, so here, take it, man, you know. But we don't know. You never know who you're going to meet every day. You never know what person's going to call you on the phone. Every day, Kelly will tell you, we have people come by the church, and we got to decide what are we going to do. Are we going to spend a few minutes talking to them? Brother Milan, I bet you he spends half his week in the office talking to folks who just came, just if nothing else, just to talk. Just to talk. And when they leave, you know they have the big smile on their face because he gave a little bit of his time to spend with them. Amen? Amen. It means so much. Last uh, year at Valentine's Day, the youth, we did a study about the five love, love languages and my love language is time. And so many people, that is what makes them feel loved. It's just that little bit of time that you might spend. A little bit of time. Who's your neighbor? Whoever you meet. Who needs help the most? You never know. But I know this. If you, if you walk away and say no, if you walk by on the other side of the road, if you see that call and go, ignore I, th- I think people do that when I call because I get a lot of clicks. Um, we get those calls during the week. Kelly's like, Kelly's getting good at discerning, like, ah, sales, marketing, no. But you never know who you're going to come into contact with. It reminds me of a story uh, about a boy who, you've probably heard this story before. His boy, he's in grade school, and he's been picked on and is really having a hard time in school. Even on the bus, I mean, kids are just drop, knocking things out of his hands. They're picking at him. They're punching him, you know, thumping his ears, doing all this stuff. And he's just, he's just, it's just really a sad situation. But one boy back there saw what was going on. He wasn't really close. He saw the boy. Uh, they had the same bus stop. He gets off. And as he was walking away, somebody just knocked all the books out of his hand. And every book that he had was, was in his book bag. I mean, every book that would have been, should have been in his locker, I guess, 
was in his book bag, and he thought, man, why are you bringing all these books? I mean, come on, you got a locker. And he just said, well, I've just got a lot of studying to do. He said, well, let me walk you to your house. So they walk him, he walks him to his house, and he spends some time with him. And uh, he says, listen, I tell you what, yet, let's go to my house. I just got the new, uh, he had the new video game thing. And he says, let's play some video games. Sure, played for hours. Next day, when he saw him at school, he said, hey, man, you know, remember me? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. They became best of friends. And as time went on, it, this kid that had been picked on all his life, seemed like, he began to get confidence because of this one guy. And he, and he was very smart. Eventually, at his high school uh, graduation, he was the valedictorian because he was so smart. And as he was beginning to give his speech, <clears throat> he told him, he said, I want to tell you a story about a special person. And he talked about his friend. He, talk, he, said, he told the same story. He said, the reason I brought all my books home that day is because I was going home to commit suicide. And I didn't want my mom to have to go get all those books out of my locker. You never know. You never know. Who's my neighbor? It could be anybody. But we'll never know if we don't stop and take the time. Let's pray. Dear Lord.